Well, we are right smack in the middle of summer. A summer, I think, that's kind of almost would say unprecedented. We haven't seen something quite like this in a long time. But it kind of brings about some good and some bad things about some of the larger companies that do what we all do, and that is some of the travel agencies out there that are big monolith type companies. There's some great things that happen when the industry is on a downturn, some things that are tougher, but we're gonna talk about monolithic agencies on this week's edition of Travel Evolved. This is Travel Evolved. Welcome. Welcome from the hiatus a little bit. Yeah, it's been a little while since we've recorded an episode <laughs> since we released one too. I'm sure it's going to go out right away after we release it because we have nothing in the can, as they say, in the industry, and we're not even in that industry. Um, but anyway, been a little while since we've released an episode. There's a lot of great reasons for us personally at Next Gen Med Staff for that to be happening, but it doesn't help those of you that are, you know, kind of Looking forward to the next thing. And I know that we're, again, a lot of you guys are following us, which is really humbling and awesome at the same time. We're just happy that it's it's going as well as it is. And what's great about this series that we're doing, this whole Travel Evolve things, is that you know, if, as long as we keep it up on YouTube and keep it on the podcast, it'll be up here forever. And hopefully the idea is that a lot of things that we're saying here in now 2023... I hope apply in 2033. There's going to be some things that that won't for sure. The industry will have hopefully evolved and changed a little bit between now and 10 years from now. Gosh, I sure hope so. But um, anyway, a lot of crazy stuff going on. It's been a an interesting summer for everybody. We're, we've got a couple uh, episodes coming up here that we popped in, uh, took advantage of kind of what's happening because it is a little unprecedented. I'll say it's a little unprecedented. It's unprecedented for many people that haven't been involved in this thing like I have for 23 years. Whew, and a half. <laughs> Got to get that half in there. Um, we've seen things like this before. Maybe you haven't. Probably haven't. I have. Um, it's it's just interesting to me. But it's been great for our company. Obviously, we've got, you know, our model just works fine with this stuff. It doesn't really affect us as much. But I thought it'd be a really good time to talk a little bit about these big companies because they're, they're dominating the industry right now. And I've been doing a lot of research on this episode. We've had plenty of time to at least research the episode. Haven't had plenty of time to record it. But we did a lot of preview on this one and, and, and really put our heads together because we thought this was important. Again, this is not going to be an episode about beating up the big four. I, I do that sometimes for things that they struggle with, I guess, for lack of a better word. I mean, we all struggle with something. I mean, I'm struggling with a new concept. There's just, you know, different things. We've done episodes on issues that happen in our industry. This is just such a bizarre industry. You look at the Triangle of Trust episode, and you can go right to that and see how many things can slip through the cracks and how just completely unique, I think, this particular industry is, especially on a national travel basis. That being said, um, it's it's it does, there are times when, things kind of alter the market, which is happening right now. And we all know why it's happening, so we don't need to go and spend a lot of time on that. But I do want to spend some time talking about, currently, the monolithic agency, because it's kind of timely, because we had this episode planned, but I kind of pushed it back. So let's see what's going on. And sure enough, this summer, we're seeing a lot of movement and activity that is what I would call somewhat atypical from these big monolithic agencies, because they're 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 reacting... I personally think, from a, just a business standpoint, very well to a changed market for their for their case, and I get exactly why they're doing it. I mean, I like it from a you know obviously a smaller you know we're not small, but a smaller than a monolith that's for sure. Uh, we are small. We're getting, we're small, but we're growing really quickly, which is great. Which is part of the reason why we've been so busy. Um, we've got 
and people that want to invest in this company and take it through the roof. And I just, I just, I don't, I don't know. We're struggling with some things because we love the brand of Next Gen Med Staff, and we don't want to see that bastardized or compromised, whatever word is you want to use. It's very important to me that we don't become one of these guys. For, it's not because they do things wrong. Let me qualify that again. Listen, I'm not here to, to you know shine anybody's shoes on this. I'm not going to say whatever. There are things that I think really stink by you know these these big big companies. But there are times when they do some things that I think are really important. It is their niche, good, bad, or indifferent. I just don't want to become one because there's already enough of them in there that it's not kind of what my vision is for Next Gen Med Staff or the industry in general. I think this kind of stuff is going to be affected. These big companies are going to be affected by more and more technology and the way that travelers travel and who it is that they want to travel through. So it's a good time to do this episode because... We wanted to explain kind of a little bit more about what they are. We're not going to name names. You guys know who they are. I don't need to do that during the episode. But we do want to kind of walk through um, how they function, how they grow, what happens during times when the censuses are down and, and things are a little squeezed and that sort of thing. So here we go. We're going to, we're going to knock that out and do the episode today. So I'm a little nasally. I am I'm, uh, I figured out the place that I'm renting. Um, I think that there either was a cat or something. I don't know. It's... <sighs> Never have been more stuffed up in the summertime than I am right now in my life, ever. So, and I'm not an allergy guy, but I'm very nasally today, and it's driving me nuts. So if my voice is irritating you, uh, still listen to the episode, because I think there's going to be some good things I'm going to say on this thing. If it's irritating me, know that. A um, couple of housekeeping issues. Obviously, we did get off our pace a little bit. You know, this this third season may be one of those where we have to have some breaks like that. It's, it's going to be that way. I know that... When we get busy as company, it's no longer easy for me to say, you know, hey, I just got to peel myself away and, and you know, record an episode. We'll, not, we'll make them up, up for them. Um, I will tell you guys this. We actually have a three-part series. Um, it's called Newbie Boot Camp coming up. And we're going to try to knock all those recordings of the episode out at once because it, it's kind of sequential. So there's no reason for me to take three weeks to record them. I want to knock them out all at once so that we can get those out there. And that should get us back on schedule and get us through this uh, latter part of summer into the fall when I know we're going to be even busier, which is um, kind of cool. So we'll kind of interfold a little bit of, of current events today, of what's going on, you know, again, here in the middle of summer of 2023. Uh, and again, it's August. I know they're going to knock this thing out as soon as we get it um, get it uploaded because it's we haven't had one in a while. So as soon as I send this raw footage back, they'll get it all put together, put the cool stuff on it, make the intros and outros, and we'll be ready to go. So let's get into it. What exactly is a monolith agency? Well, I mean, right now there seems to be about four of them. There's there's a few others that are trying to become that next um, monolith company. It's a difficult process, but basically these are the big, big four. It used to be three. Um, there really are three, but I'll throw one in there because they there's one hospital system, the largest in the country, that happens to have their own staffing agency. They don't do a lot, so they're really not part of it, but they kind of are. Hard to explain. Again, I'm, I'm talking around things. I, I really don't want a bunch of attorneys calling me up and saying, hey, use their company name. You guys know who they are. There are three big companies that hold a huge amount of contracts. And there's one of them that has their intern, own internal. They struggle as well, but there really are four. There's four monolith companies, in my opinion, that are control a lot of the supply of new positions to agencies based upon the supply and demand of their own hospitals that they contract through. So what are they? Well, they're the big, big guys. And over time, over the last, you know, 30 some, you know, roughly close to 30 years, 28 years or so, however long this industry has been around, many of these guys grew from gobbling up an acquisition of other companies. Matter of fact, most of them did. Um, one of them spent over 36, I'm sorry, one point, let's, let's rephrase that, $1.36 billion in acquisitions over their course of their history. So they are definitely in the let's find companies that are in a rise, let's gobble them up. They actually have those companies retain their own identity and they just swallow them up in, uh, under the parent company so that they can, you know, they, it feels like you're still not working for one of the big monolith companies, although you are. And you guys know what I'm talking about, but it's kind of crazy how they've done that. Done that, a lot of this through acquisition. Every one of them has acquired huge amounts of companies. I did some, we did some research and it's kind of remarkable how a company that has success all of a sudden, boom, they're, they're part of one of these guys that get gobbled up. I guess that's good for those of you that want to start your own agency, but you have to get to a pretty good point where you are worthwhile and sustainable to be able to be that way. 
And you'd be surprised how long that can take. Um, there's certainly some vendor management systems that have been gobbled up by the monolith companies. There are lots that are independent. Um, three of these companies are publicly traded. One still isn't, which again, my hat's off to them um, that they were founded by you know a gentleman and, and frankly, they're still privately held, which is, I really, a lot of, a lot of kudos and a lot of respect for that company. They were able to do that. You know, again, I, I have my, not differences with big companies. I think I used to have more of a, an ax to grind with them because I was so frustrated with the amount of margin that they would take. But I think over time I've kind of realized as, as I have been in charge of a company or companies that have started to grow, especially this one, that it is interesting to me how the old model works that you kind of have to thicken your margin as you do in fact get bigger. So I, I've had a little bit more of an understanding. Again, it's their niche. Like I always said, if I was a CEO of one of these big companies, I would be you know, talking about our strengths and definitely downplaying our weaknesses. But it really is, again, I don't want to stress this too much, but I do have a lot of respect for that one company that still has remained private. The temptation by the majority shareholder of not wanting to cash out, have a huge payday taking this company public and running off the sunset. There's There's got to be a lot there that has to do with wanting to make sure that whatever that vision was, that it remains that vision. Um, and who knows, maybe that person just wants to work still and has it. But there's, there has to have been a lot of temptations and um, still probably to this day of, of having that big payday. But, you know, I'm sure there's also times like maybe right now that maybe they're second guessing those decisions. But in the long run, it's, I, again, I'm just impressed with that because I understand the temptation of being able to say, hey, let's just, you know, be done and cash out. This can be a very stressful, I shouldn't say can be, this is a very stressful industry from this side of the desk sometimes. I, I know I'm preaching the, preaching the choir. You guys have the same thing happen to you, but it's very different in, as far as what it is. I, I've always said I think yours is a little more severe. It's a little more drastic, what you guys have to be aware of and be armed for, and not only just you know predatory-type companies and contracts, but more often you know the clinical side of things, whereas you're also still trying to focus on doing your job. And, and some of the I don't know, just the environment in which you guys work in. It just seems like lately we're just hearing more and more just yuckiness. I just, again, I've never worked in a hospital, spent a lot of time with travelers in facilities, especially early on in my career. A lot of respect there, but most of us agency people, especially like a, you know, a recruiter or an account manager or, or a credentialing specialist or somebody in payroll, they usually really don't have a clue what it's really like. They've never actually seen it firsthand. They can hear about it and, and they get it. But they really don't. You guys should know that. Most of us really don't have a true understanding of the, the work side of what you do and how pressure-filled that is and how difficult that is to be able to maintain composure and still deal with what you're working on on a daily basis, yet having to also deal with agencies and contracts and you know, offers and, and you know, being terminated and changes in your schedule and gone call. All that list goes on and on. So anyway, off topic. These big monolith companies, let's get back to those for a minute, they have huge fulfillment power. In other words, these are big, big companies. These are companies that have thousands and thousands and thousands of travelers working for them. I mean, again, it's, it, there are differences. The one, one I'm talking about is either extra relative, relatively small. The other two, are, other three, I should say, are quite large. And we oftentimes don't know exactly how many people they have. But I know it's, it's a lot. It's more than what you guys would think. The great thing about that is they can literally walk into a system and say, hey, you know, here's who we are, and we want the whole thing. We want the whole contract. We want every single hospital in the system because we can handle it. And the fact is, most times, they can handle it with the help of a lot of us agencies who subcontract through them. During times like right now, they can handle it totally on their own. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? They are. They're handling it on their own to the best of their ability. We've seen that most of the, of the latter part of spring or even most of spring and here into halfway through the summer or maybe summer's on the end. I don't know what you call, I guess, Autumn's coming up and fall's coming up. I don't know what the official date of it is. But we're still in summertime. And again, we're starting to see some cracks in that armor where they're not quite fulfilling a lot. And we know this, by the way, 
those of us agencies that are not one of the foreign monolith companies, we can see by the number of jobs that we're being given. It's not that all of a sudden the census is increasing substantially in certain parts of the country. I will tell you because it happens to be places where it's still ridiculously hot and nobody is going there uh, to increase that census right now. It's just they're not fulfilling it. So that's when they say, hey, I guess we don't want to look too bad for hospitals. We need to reach out to those people that are contracted through us, through our, our vendor management system or directly and say, hey, we need some help. And that's when they start to, to throw bones the stronger the agencies first down to the you know the people that haven't really delivered so we can see how difficult they're having very you know i won't name names or give you real specifics but today we saw jobs for places that we hadn't seen since you know it was cold out uh, so maybe in march from certain locations that were you know again they happen to be warm weather so not a lot of difficulty fulfilling them as far as the number of people there because there's not that many positions i should say let me, let me qualify that a little better it's not that they have difficulty fulfilling them. It's that those areas where it's really, really hot in the summertime don't have a census increase. So typically, their staff and their and their staff, you know, travelers can handle most of it. When they have a little bit of bump in in a, in a spike in a census in a unit or somewhere, they can reach out and usually they can fulfill that on their own. What we're seeing now is that they're not. So either either one of two things: that either the census is bumping higher than they can fulfill, or they are in fact having difficulty convincing travelers. They're like, we need to get this filled. So let's reach out to some other agency to see if someone has. You know, some poor soul that's willing to take a low rate down here in this ridiculously hot weather this time, you know, middle of summer. And, and we will. We'll find them for them. Because there's some people out there that, like I've always said, every assignment's not for everybody. And you cannot judge other people if someone's willing to take a assignment because it might be the perfect fit. They may have always wanted to go to that town. They may have family there. They may be close to where they live. And they can do a, a, a local travel assignment, so to speak. So that's what's happening throughout the summer. And it's weird because it kind of is ebbing and flowing. Typically, I will tell you guys, during the summertime, it's pretty straightforward. You get the, you get the jobs. They're, they're there for a little while. You kind of want to fill them quick because people are willing to jump on them, and they kind of get filled. By the time we get into August, things are a little bit slower, uh, August and September, because it's just not there. Again, we all know kids go back to school. It's like a Petri dish. A lot of things happen. You know, next thing you know, you got a bunch of people together. People start getting colds and flus and all that kind of stuff in normal years. And we're going to probably see that again this year, which means... I will bet you that we'll have this almost like a pausing dead silence in the industry when it comes to September, October of what's going to happen here. Are we going to have you know some needs everywhere? Are, this, are the people from the north heading down south? Is, is the sense going to you know move around and shift a lot? That'll all be determined, and that will also have a lot to do with what's kind of happening. So here's what I'm telling you, though. They, these, these monolith companies are super strong. They have that ability. I, right now, if some hospital system, let's say, I don't care if it was a just a five hospital system in some you know part of the country that only had five hospitals in it and they called and said we want you to be our sole provider for all of our systems of course we would want to jump on it but to be realistic especially with our model i mean if we had recruiters i would say here's what i would be doing those companies that do that everyone drop what you're doing do not recruit for anything else but these five hospitals try to convince every traveler out there to take an assignment in one of these five hospitals so we can garner and get this contract and we can retain it and manage it and it'll be ours and then we'll try to subcontract that's really the thought process behind that sort of thing so for me, with what we do at Next Gen Med Staff, I'm not going to sell anything. We're never going to say, let's let's push on the app certain jobs and have them be you know on the top of the page or anything like that. This is this is we're totally different. It would be counter <laughs> counterproductive and counterintuitive to everything I stand for and the whole reason why I want to change this industry. If I was to push one system over the other, so I'm not going to. And as a matter of fact, that's why we struggle. We don't really want direct hospital contracts. We get some here and there, and we kind of tell them, we're you know. We're, we'd happy to put them in the mix, and, and if our bill rate's good, you're going to pop up a lot, and you're going to be the top paying in the area, so you'll probably be able to get some fulfillment, but we are not going to push you over somebody else in a different state or even in that city because it's going to come down to you know the reputation of the hospital and a traveler's willingness to want to go there based upon probably more often than not, drum roll, your bill rate and how that's going to present itself. So um, it, it's kind of interesting because they do, in fact, have that ability to be able to say, we can knock this out. And again, in normal times, they don't knock out 100% of it. They're knocking out, who knows? I don't know if it's half. I don't know if it's 75%. It's certainly not all of it because that's why they subcontract it. There are, uh, I don't know of, the, well, none of these four vendors don't subcontract. Let's put it that way. So there are times when they clearly have needs for other agencies to come in and help them. And this is where, and I'll get into more detail on this, this is where they say, okay, we're going to offer this same contract to a handful of other companies, let's just say. When 10 more companies, we're going to give them, give it to them. 
Now, what they may not tell you know those companies, and we all know this, and what you guys probably don't know is maybe they have a hundred dollar bill rate that they're working with directly with that system in that area. I'm just using that as a nice easy example. They may present a ninety five dollar or a ninety dollar bill rate to the agency and not say, "Now go fill it." They're also going to charge them a five percent fee. So you're talking about another you know two dollars and or, you know close to four bucks. So let's say it's ninety five. Now that agency is really dealing with about a ninety one dollar rate compared to them dealing with a hundred dollar rate so already nine bucks off the plate most of that as you guys know is yours you know depending on the agency's margin let's just pretend it's you know 30 percent. so 70 percent of that is yours and uncle sam's when it comes to tax stuff that goes off the table and that's why it's sometimes difficult but it's remarkable how oftentimes even with that lowered bill rate a smaller agency can oftentimes beat the margin of a big agency if their agency is well into the 30s and you've got an agency that's closer to 20 percent it's kind of remarkable. Sometimes that small agency can actually out-deliver a payroll package than by subcontracting, working through a big vendor like that if their margin is huge. It's, it happens all the time. I know because i got a couple of VPs in two of those different companies that share a lot of information with me. I will never name names. Don't worry, I'm not going to. But I, we talk a lot. and I mean, they're miserable. They work for the big companies, the two of them, and they, they, it's hard for them. They, they, they understand. But there are also some good um, benefits for them from a an operation standpoint and they're also career people so they're not going to go anywhere and they're almost some of them are a couple one of them almost is done so maybe we'll get her on <laughs> at some point when she's retired and we can talk turkey i don't know if we ever will or not but that's the bottom line is that these companies have this huge buying power so they can do this which means during times like right now the time frame that we're in right now it's just again what well, the reason you guys are not seeing a huge amount of jobs and again, we have talked to numerous travelers. Matter of fact, every time, and some of you guys know this, every time I've been on the phone with somebody, I've asked you, hey, what's, what, are you, what are you seeing out there? What's the deal? For the last probably 60 to 90 days, I've asked this question to just about everybody I've talked to. And categorically, it's all the same thing. Not that many jobs, pay rates are down, and, it's, you know, it's, and my three companies, my agencies that I really like, don't seem to have much of anything right now. When they do, it's, it's just kind of eh, here and there, places I don't really want to go to. The reason behind that, guys and gals, is because these big companies are not subcontracting. They're trying to fulfill them on their own. So what you're seeing is less jobs and all, let's just, pretend, let's, let's just say 90% of them are being handled by these four companies. If in a, in a magical world, let's say they were, they were not subcontracting at all, that would mean 90% of the jobs are being fulfilled because they're able to do this and they're offering lower rates because their margins are high. That's just the way it is. You know, Again, don't blame them. That's just the way it is. If you want to work in a certain place right now in the country and this company has it and they're not subcontracting it to anybody else, you either work at this lower rate because of their thicker margins or you don't work there at all. You have to make a decision. And this is where I'm, I, I will come in and say that you can't be mad at these companies. They, they have... Boards of directors, three of them do out of four. They have shareholders. I'm sure they're shareholders of the fourth one. They're just not publicly traded. They have responsibilities. They have margins they have to keep based upon their dynamics and what their business model is and what their projections are and what they promise to those people that are investors and or shareholders. They have no choice. And you guys have a choice. And lots of times the choice is either work or don't work. And that's where a lot of people are choosing right now to not work. That's why we say the market will kind of fix itself. For every travel that's not willing to work, there is another travel that's saying, ooh, ooh, I will. And it reduces the competition factor. You might be getting jobs. What I'll tell you guys, and you guys probably know this by now about me, I, I, I analyze everything number-wise. I just It's just fascinating. It's, and it's simple stuff. But in the last three summers we are down substantially on our number of submissions but up increasingly or a huge amount on bookings and growth which tells us that last couple of years we were just people were just I'll, I'll go i'll go i'll go and they were still kind of going ooh, and they, i think they were bettering their deal and doing other things or finding something close by it was more competition so we let's say put you know 100 people in front and I'll just use some numbers. Let's say 20 of them are getting jobs last summer. If we put 50 people in front this summer, we're getting 25, 30, 40 people jobs. To kind of show you what it means. It means there's less competition. So, um, I mean, we got two offers today. Um, both of them are brand new, and we're waiting for an extension. I mean, this happens every day almost. And this one of the people today was had went in front of one place. The other gentleman went in front of two places. And he's still in front of the other one, but he's got the offer. He's taking it. So we've got two two offers with three submissions total with two people, and they're getting booked. So it tells you that when 
you know, they're not seeing the volume of submissions that they were seeing. I don't know what that is. You guys can make your own, judge your own thing, but at least with my company, what I'm telling you is that our bookings are up, but the percentages are up too. In other words, we're putting less, fewer people in front of fewer jobs and getting more placements, if that makes sense. Take it for what it's worth. It's an interesting wrinkle and something really weird to think about. And I love this kind of stuff because it kind of keeps me at night, keeps me going because I'm always trying to figure out what's going on. The truth is I'm never going to know because you can hear some things from other companies, you can hear things from you guys, but the fact is it's a lot of economics and a lot of you know how things are moving in this market. And it's, it's so difficult to know and to predict. But we do know this. One thing I can tell you is experience is, is going to start picking up again. So there you go. That's what they can do. These big companies have the ability to have huge buying power. They can literally walk in and say, we want this. It's a lot like vendors that steal from each other. You know, they, they do. Vendors, you'll have a hospital that's working one vendor next you know, oh, we've got a notice from another vendor saying they're taking the system over. Happened just the other day in, in, in Nevada in a system uh, a couple months ago, actually. With with the big monolith agencies, less and less that because oftentimes, you know, one of them is their own system, right? They own those hospitals, so they're not going to change. The other ones, I mean, they get it. I mean, you're not going to really gain a lot. It'd be a huge amount to kind of go from one of there. It does happen here and there, but for the most part, they're kind of hanging on to their their own facilities, and their own systems, and they don't they don't steal as much as they can from each other. It's it's more difficult because. They're getting fulfillment for the most part because these companies do a phenomenal job. I will tell you guys, a phenomenal job of fulfilling the needs. Because if it's too low for you, it's not too low for you know maybe someone's going to be watching our, our our newbie boot camp series. There are people that will take jobs. You guys cannot blame them for taking those positions if they're less because you don't know what that person's going through. Maybe they haven't worked in a while. Maybe they had a little bit of a, a lapse in their resume and they really need a position and this manager is willing to hire them because there was barely anybody in front. Maybe they threw out a low rate to see what they get and they scored. They got someone that's got some good clinical ability that maybe had a, you know, like I say, a lapse in their, in their time that they've been in bedside nursing or maybe it's just there. It happens to be a great fit for them location-wise and the cost of living-wise. Maybe they did their research on that. So, these companies can fulfill. It's one of the best things that they can do. And like I've always told you guys, if you're a traveler working for one of these big companies, and I, will, I would say this, I don't think I've ever said this on an episode before, but I think that if you are in this day and age, in, 20, in summer of 2023, if you're working with three or four companies, A, I hope Next Gen Med Staff's one of them. But I would also say, I really think it would be a good idea to put one of these big companies in the mix because maybe they're your fourth choice. And frankly, I probably would have them be your fourth choice because, I mean, do I want to say that? Not necessarily. In normal times, I would probably say they're your fourth choice because you have plenty of other options that are going to pay you more, even in the same town, right? Right now, I don't know if they'd be my fourth choice, but if I was a traveler, I would definitely have next gen med staff as one of mine because we're the top paying company out there but i would have this com these companies in there at least one the one i like the most the one that i that i dislike the least whatever you want to call it because i want options as a traveler i want to know that yeah i'm going to shoot for the stars i'm going to try to get this but if there's a lot of competition for a position i know if i call one of these four monolith companies i'm going to be able to get a recruiter that can get me a job because i need to work in a couple weeks or i need to work when this assignment's over i don't think currently there's anything wrong with that and i i guess like i'm saying i'm checking myself I think right now, I don't know what choice they're going to be. I think they would be equal. All four of these, these agencies would be equal. I would be putting a lot of effort in the companies that pay the highest. I'd be putting effort in companies that, that I enjoyed working for. But I, you know, again, I always say three, maybe four companies. Right now, wouldn't it have been a bad idea to have one of these big companies as in your pocket as one of the people you're working for? Because for me, as a traveler, it's an insurance policy. I'm going to shoot for this but I've got this in the event that I can't find this high-paying position or I don't get the job offered to me, which is, again, we never really know. Just because some of our people right now are having a decent time with their competition level doesn't mean it's always the case or for all of you or it's going to be the case. So right now, I think having one of these monolith companies as one company you're communicating with, and be careful how I say this, you don't want them to block you from working with another company. So... We'll talk about that more here in a second, but be careful of which one you choose and make it very clear that I may be going in front of some other jobs with you with another company that, that I'm not giving you the green light to stop that and only submit me through you. But, you know, look at the stuff that they're offering. I don't know why you wouldn't want, especially right now, to at least have some some options. I know a lot of people on Facebook are just absolutely snarky and very, you know, oh, the rates are terrible, but 
you know what? So they are terrible, so you don't choose them. But what's wrong with having at least some options to see, here's a whole bunch of jobs. Maybe I'll choose the least terrible, but I think terrible to me is not working at all. So anyway, buying power is a huge deal with them. Monolith companies, I'll just, let's just go into this, this part of this episode because I think it's the biggest part. These huge companies have real issues when it comes to their pay rate, which means they have large margins. Here's what I want to get on their side and kind of explain some stuff to you guys. And again, this is just, I'm just reporting, right? This industry is made up of hundreds and hundreds of agencies, clearly. Here's what I would hope. I would hope that every agency out there, at least in their own mind, believes that they have a unique pitch. There's something, <laughs> anything, please, that they do that's different from the other 480, whatever, how many other agencies are there? I don't even know how many agencies are. If any of you guys know, do a thing and figure it out. I don't, I don't think you can, they get changes every day. I'd like to think that they brand themselves differently. You and I both know that most of them don't. I look back at, at myself and my career. I mean, we tried to brand, but our only brand many times was, at first, in, at first most of my career, it was like what the, everyone does, and that you're trying to brand based upon for lack of a better word, your recruiters were the mouthpiece of your company. So you wanted great recruiters who represented your company well. You wanted your credentialing people and your account managers to all be better than everybody else's because that was the, the image that you would project. That's really what most companies still do to this day. Now, I got in a kick many years ago about wanting my margins to be thinner and be able to pay more. I just felt, you know, duh, that I could grow a company faster if, if word of mouth got out there and we were paying higher turned out I was right. Once we started getting word of mouth out and social media was great, all of a sudden whew, you know, went through the roof, almost too, not almost too fast. It's the way it goes. Right now, obviously there are, a, there are more and more companies that do have a uniqueness. I'd love to think that I'm the CEO of one of them. I'm very lucky to be in that position because I think it's fun and it's awesome to not just be a cookie cutter company. Every one of these companies, every one of us has at least something to tell. And here's what I will tell you, on, on a big company, one of the things that they can't really talk about or compete with is the amount that they pay weekly for that particular position. Okay, fine. Again, this is just me reporting. Here's what they can <laughs> brag about. Like I said, they have jobs everywhere. Many of them have monop wow, monopolistic opportunities that nobody else has, especially in times like this. But when it comes to their pay rates, they just they just can't. And here's the reason why. And this is what I think where my opinion has changed over the last five years, really. I still think there's some work to be done. But currently, right now, these companies, it takes a ton of people to operate them. And I've mentioned this before, and it's kind of a hard concept to understand. But it's all kind of surrounded and predicated on the fact that most companies, if not all of them, I think 90, not even a percentage, most companies overwhelming majority of companies pay every single week, which means we have deadlines. We have got to run a payroll, do all of our checks and balances, make sure people are the best we can getting paid perfectly and effectively every week. The bigger you get, the more of a challenge that becomes. And yes, what happens to companies, as you guys know, is they break things out into regions. They've got certain things going so that somebody in Massachusetts who has who was working in a hospital out there isn't waiting for somebody in San Diego to you know get their their timesheet turned in so they get paid too. It, it, the bigger you get, the more people you have involved. But that's where part of that comes from. You've got multiple payroll groups in different parts of the country, potentially, handling different travelers, having different regions. You've got different people credentialing. You've got different people that are you know, recruiting. You've got recruiters from home, recruiters that are working in your, in your building. That building gets bigger. You've got higher expenses. You've got to start promoting people to be in charge of, of these groups of people. If you open up a satellite office, let's say in Denver for one of these big companies, you've got you know maybe a couple of hundred, maybe let's say you have 50 people working at an office. You've got to have somebody running it. You've got to have a vice president there. You've got to have someone in charge of operations in the Denver branch. You see how I'm saying is that the operating expenses get higher and higher. There's really no way to avoid that in this current model. You know, obviously we think we figured out a way to avoid a lot of that, but eventually we'll be in the same boat too as far as, well, I shouldn't say it like that. We're not going to be in the same boat, but eventually we do have an economics of scale. That's part of what this means is that payroll 
we don't can't be helped. We can we we got some ideas on payroll, by the way, and I'm not going to share them out here. I share too much sometimes. But those of you that are working for me know, if you haven't already been reached out about kind of a unique concept we have with with some ways to to do some better things with payroll. The whole app itself is it, that's part of what it was. It's, it's we wanted to be able to cut costs. When you don't have something that can cut your costs, then you've got those expenses. So these these agencies, these monolith companies, have huge margins for a reason. I think I used to say, and I think a lot of people believe that it's just because they just want to, they're greedy and want to make a lot of money. Yeah, I think there are ways they could certainly, they could certainly make less money. But they have a program, they have a, they have a, a model, they have a, you know, they have projections that they have signed off on in front of, you know, very important, very powerful people that, that are, you know, boards of directors and that sort of thing. They have a hard time changing their concept. I will say this, and I still believe it's my heart of hearts. As time goes by, you guys will see when these big monolith companies start changing their recruitment model to being more like what Next Gen MedStaff is doing, I think you're gonna start seeing a bigger sweep and change in the industry. You're already gonna start seeing that. I don't know how it's gonna work. I don't know if one of the big companies will do it or some of the guys. You'll start to see where people will begin an attempt to try to reduce their margins. I believe that will happen. And I think the more that you guys go to work for companies that do pay better. If you're basing most of your assignments on who's paying the most, it'll naturally happen. What you have to give right now, especially most companies. I don't care if they're you know a, a thousand people working for them or they have ten people working for them. Right now, most companies are not seeing the positions. If you like that company, fine, go take a you know job wherever you have to do. Do what you got to do. Jump on with a monolith company, but don't forget about your favorite company back there because they'll have them again. And that's where I love those of you that chase the dollars. I just think that's what you should be doing. I've always said in Travel Evolved that what I would do is look for the highest paying assignments. Do the economics on it. Check to see what the cost of living is there. Really make sure that just because you're getting paid grossly, that your net after your whole operating expenses with your housing, your food, the whole deal, is all going to be a bigger amount that's going to be able to actually keep. Then I would choose five of those and decide of these which makes the most sense. And I always would say I typically would have pay be that factor and that leading indicator of what the jobs I'm going to at least consider. I think that's kind of more along the lines of what many of you guys do now. I, I have noticed a wonderful shift away from loyalty to loyalty to thyself, which is I want to make sure I'm making as much money as I can as a traveler. And I think that's a great start for a change in the industry. And that's what's going to happen. These monolithic companies will have to eventually change somewhat. I don't know if they're going to be able to switch the whole thing. I mean, only time will tell. They've got a ton of money behind them, so we'll see. But they will have to change their entire model. And I think that they will at least begin to cut some of the fat to allow for them to pay more and still have a good bottom line so that their shareholders and the board of directors and the public you know the public that's that owns their shares are, are happy as well because at the end of the day that's what they really care about how much money is it we're making how much is too much so that we start losing the traveler and they'll start to kind of fall in line but the reasons that they have the biggest difficulty is is just because they've got fat margins they just do they have to make more of that pie than most other companies. So again, if you're working for one of these big companies, this is why, again, it's, it's not a bad thing. I don't want to explain this in their way, but when I was talking about how there's 500 different companies, let's say, I know there's more than that probably. They all have, they, I would like to think they have, a, they, have a, they have a brand that's unique. Consider, you know, you're not going to hear this from the big companies. One of the things they don't really do is they're not out there in social media. They don't do a lot of advertising. They don't really need to. But understand if you go to work for them, just make it right with your own head by saying, this is, I'm throwing that company in there because they have a unique wrinkle and that is that they have a lot of more positions than the average company does, especially right now. When things are a little bit more of a bull kind of situation and, I, and I've got a better market where there's lots of movement activity, then maybe I'll, I can I have some options where I don't necessarily have to rely on them. But right now, many of you guys have, have told me that you're kind of relying on some of these companies, and I, I think that's smart. I mean, I really do. You're never going to hear. What's the last time I heard a CEO of a company say, I think you should go to work for somebody else besides us. I think you should go where you need to go. That's what this whole concept is. I, I just think it's time, time for you guys to start taking your career in your own hands and stop trusting people you barely know with making decisions on where you should be going. I mean, Parade yourself. I said it a couple episodes ago. I know it's been a while since I recorded it, but you should be completely thumping the market and saturating it with you on the places you want to go to. I've got a couple of people, uh, one of my search techs who's literally been with me for almost since the beginning, over two years now. I won't say his name, but I love him and his wife to death. Great people. As he gets closer to assignment, he starts you know, to submit himself through our app, 
pretty early on, about six, seven weeks. A little bit too early, but it's happened. It's actually got jobs for, especially when things were tight when the pandemic was going on. What's happening now is he actually got an offer uh, the other day to go to another place. It wasn't one of them today, but it was another one from yesterday. He got an offer, and he's going to jump on it. But he was saturating. He was he was he was looking at stuff he wanted to apply for. But about every day, he was applying to one or two positions. Happens to be a surge tech, so a little bit more competition. And I think he's a little bit limited to where he's willing to go. So he's kind of put his own kind of parameters on what he wants. So what he does is he saturates the market of our market with him. And we're okay with it because we know that when he gets an interview and a job, he's already done the research on the pay. So that's done. Now he has to decide, okay, I chose this job. Was it a good paying and a less desirable? Was it a nicer place and the pay is low? But we already know that he wouldn't have submitted himself. He didn't already have decided that if I get this, I would probably take it. Now, what we hope is that he gets a couple offers, but it hasn't been the case this uh, this last couple of go-rounds because things have been thinner in that department. So um, we're excited, though, because he has it. And that's what this whole thing is about. When you have... When you're a big, big company, there are some things that are, I think, like I say, are really, really good. And I can't believe that, you know, maybe you don't believe that a CEO told you that right now. I, I think, and I've, I've talked to a lot of you, even those that have worked for me. There's some people right now that are not working for me that worked for me for two or three assignments in a row that took a break from us because they had to. They said, I'm going to come running right back. Some of them, like, left and are working at home, working per diem. I mean, this is smart travel health care, you guys. And this is why I think... Th- Agencies like ours, and there's more than just us, by the way, that are starting to think openly about how do we present ourselves to a traveler so that when the time is right, we make more sense than everybody else. And this is what these monolithic agencies are doing. Right now, the timing might be right that they might make more sense. So this, this right now is kind of a good thing. They are, they are helping travelers stay gainfully employed during a time when the market's kind of low. Now, you may not be making as much money, but I want you to understand there are reasons. And it's not necessarily that it's just all greed. I think the greed, by the way, comes in on some of the larger mom and pop companies. I think if you really want to know where the greed in our industry comes in, it's a lot of these companies that are doing very, very well. They're still privately owned. They're not the monolithic companies, but they're the ones that are just eking up their thing higher than what their costs are. So they're actually going higher. But we'll talk about that in our day. But it's not necessarily these monolithic companies that are purposely trying to not pay as well. I think they would rather pay more and have more travelers, but it, it just works out with their model and the way it works. This is what it is. And I know that they sit there and struggle with what kind of margins we have to have, what kind, what's our barometer for our travelers. But they know what they're doing. These companies do over a billion dollars in sales a year. They make $300 million. One of them, I, I know, a few years back. I mean, they, it was more than just travel health care, but it was all part of the subsidiaries of that, of that field. $300 million. Last time I checked, that was 30%. And that was back in 2018, 2019. So things are changed now, but there are reasons why these companies are have these margins. It's It just is what it is. And there are times when it should make sense to you guys. And right now, that's one of those times. It is They are formed to make money. When they go public or if they're a company like the one that hasn't gone public yet, they are all of us. We're all trying to make money. If you think that I'm not trying to make money at NextGen, you're crazy. I just want to do it differently. I want to do it by word of mouth and growth and size and shrinking my margin because I think that's a way to do it. Just the way I want to, I want to go. Other companies like to you know work with less travelers and, and make more money. Each one of them, that's fine. My model happens to be different. I'd rather have more travelers come to me, tell each other about what we're doing, say, hey, listen, you know, Next gen, if you have an opportunity to work with them over other companies, I would recommend them because they're going to pay more and here's what you expect with them, that sort of thing. And as, as time goes by, all of us newer companies are working out kinks and things that I didn't expect. I didn't know growth would be this fast that I would have to do some things differently. It took me by surprise, but it's a wonderful problem to have. I've never had this problem before where growth was faster than what I wanted and all of a sudden like, okay, we've got some we've got some things we've got to fix and everyone said you love your company a couple things here and there i would recommend and we're all over those and that's where i think what, what a good company does so at any rate companies are formed to make money hospitals work exactly the same way this is not a unique concept so don't blame the big guys for wanting to make money it just you know you guys do the same thing you have learned to be out and protective of yourself and make as much money as you can there's nothing wrong with that so you can't fault the, these agencies these big monoliths for doing the same thing But, you know, I mean, if you really think about this, you guys have learned to find, and here I am telling you guys, find the assignment that pays the most. That's what you are in the business of doing. You are in the business of of protecting your own business. In other words, you want the highest revenue you can get. You want the lowest expense, so you put the most in your pocket. And that's all called based upon other variables that that are important to you. 
So you can't be mad. I shouldn't say you can't be mad. There are companies that feel that they've got something to offer and that's why their rates may be lower because their margins higher. It's not for you to necessarily judge, but it's for you to understand what that means and how to, how to make a decision on it. But you cannot be angry. I shouldn't say you can't be. Don't let it bother you. It's, it's like an agency. I, I hear that sometimes in our side of business. Oh, I can't believe this one nurse. Watch, watch, watch out for her or him. I mean, we do talk. All they want to do is they want to chase dollars and they're dropping contracts. I mean, I'm going to say, well, can you blame them? We're doing the same thing. We're trying to make as much money as we can without basically, you know, being being overly high charged. You know, most companies do that. And that's what I was tired of this industry. I was tired of that feeling because it happens all the time. I guess right now is a good time for me to take a little bit of a break and talk about you guys. Those of you out there that want to start your own company. I've seen this a lot lately and we're going to have a I got a pretty good episode coming up that's also timely about just more about what's happening right now. I just want to fill in some blanks. I think it'll be good for years to come when there are more similar times like this. And I think they'll be coming as well. Starting your own company. The biggest misnomer, I think, and I can say this from repeated experience with a lot of travelers who I would consider friends of mine who started their own agency almost categorically I'm trying to think every one of them runs into a point where it's like oh we have to actually run a business and it's I see every time and you guys if I don't care if you're on you know Instagram or you hear it on a Facebook page or TikTok or somewhere there's always a, a traveler or a group of travelers that we're in a former own company we're going to do it different and some of you guys buy into that and I don't blame you it's 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 a feel good concept yes I would rather work for another traveler who's been there than give some you know, faceless company or a monolith company, my my employment and make let them make money through me. What happens is this is a tough business. Most travel healthcare professionals that start their own company say that the what they're gonna do is we're gonna be different. We're gonna pay you more. We're gonna have be able to do this stuff for you. We're gonna have it where you can take vacations and we're gonna have, you know, uh, better I don't know, thinner margins. We're going to have all, if all of you guys come to work for us, we'll be able to, you know, go down to a 10% margin. We're going to have backup plans for, you know, be able to work per diem if you're not working here. And it all starts off with this great grandeur. And I, I love that about travelers because you guys do go into this almost categorically with innocence and with good, with, with, with a good, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't even think of it today intention of what it is you want or trying to do really and truly almost across the board every time i hear that I, I, my heart kind of swells and goes i love these people because they they really do want to help you really do want to help the other travelers and that's why i think many of you travelers jump on and say yes let's go with these guys they're going to be great what happens as commonly as that first part is every one of them realizes that they can't compete when it comes to certain things they, they can't compete their margins are too thin they can't maintain they have to borrow twice or ten times the amount of money to handle that accounts receivable while it's all out there and they struggle with that there's so many they can't they struggle with getting the concepts of getting the contracts when there are times like right now it's really difficult for a new company to walk out and just jump on a contract here in the summer of 2023 it's really difficult when you haven't proven yourself you can be a great salesperson and you can talk yourself into some, but you're going to struggle with that. And all of them at some point become the rest of the agencies. Why do you think right now there's not a handful or a couple of dozen or 50 companies out there that are the top companies because they're traveler ran? Because they're probably not traveler ran anymore, they're not here, or they become not traveler anymore. I mean, answer that question for me before you jump on board with another. We're going to be a better company. I mean, if you jump on at the very beginning, you could do well because you probably make more money than a lot of companies because they haven't figured it out yet. But about a year or two in it, they're going to figure it out. So the answer, the question I'm asking you is, if this stuff works so well, and you guys understand the industry, why don't you see, you know, 25 of the top, you know, companies, all of them being traveler, you know, either nurse or allied ran? Because they can't, they can't sustain it. So it sucks, it's, and it's a reality check. And that's one of the first things I talk to people about is that I, I love, I think this, this business could use some more competition. I think there's always room for good people to be on this side of the desk. It, it just becomes difficult because of the sheer numbers and the competition factor. It is a cutthroat business. It is aimed at being difficult. Um, 
just because you've got so many opposing forces, and that's kind of what I'm talking about. You guys wanting to make more money, the hospital wanting to spend a little bit, the agency trying to make as much of the margin as they can. It works against each other, and you're always trying to sell or not be sold on a bad deal, right? So that's how it happens. Um, it, it just is a tough part of the industry. So again, I'm not saying don't start your own company. I'm just saying be careful with jumping on board with somebody that has. Let them sharpen their teeth a little bit. I think you'll find that it changes, and that's just what kind of sucks. It, it's almost like this industry squeezes the life and the good intentions out of a lot of people, and that's what I didn't like and why I was leaving. I'm like, I'm just done. This industry is yucky. It's gross. People you know, get half truths, and they, they it's just no one really, they just want to talk about, you can talk you know what when they don't even know what they're talking about. It, it's just, it's an ugly yucky industry where it's all social media driven and as we're seeing with you know stuff right now out there politically wise it's it's controlled by how things are done social media wise and a lot of it's just not even accurate which is kind of wild always has been the case so it's hard when you see things like this happen and you want to go yes go get them but you know in the back of your mind that they're going to struggle there's some great people out there that do it i just it's it's the concept it's not the we're going to be better it, you, nowadays, you have to figure out a way to be and pay better. And we think we have. So, again, I'm not going to jump into that again. I seem to always do it, though. All right, so here's here's what we need to talk about here. Why does it take more money to run these big companies? Like I said, I kind of got into it a little bit. But let me kind of go further on this. Let's just talk about, well, I'll talk about payroll. We can talk about credentialing. We can talk about recruiting. But payroll itself, I've mentioned this on, I think, the payroll errors episode, where the timeline is still the same, but you've got, you know, 20, 100 times more timesheets coming in, trying to work through those and all the nuances, whether it's Kronos, whether you're missing shifts on a, a vendor's website, whether the travel themselves are sending things in and they're not very clear, not legible. There's so many reasons why payroll becomes magnified that you actually have to have more and more people handle, you know, the same, less numbers of travelers because the system itself kind of falls into itself where that, that deadline is tough. You know, the option is to pay for everybody every other week, but no one would adhere to that. So you, these bigger companies have to start bringing in more payroll because they've got to make sure their payroll as best as they can, as perfect as it can. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I don't think there's a company out there that wants to purposely not pay you properly because they know that that's the first reason why you would you know, run and, and turn tail. So I think all companies do their best to try to get payroll done as best as they can, but these bigger companies have a bigger challenge than, than a smaller company because it's a huge number of timesheets coming in from a huge variety of sources, all trying to get into that same deadline and hitting those adhere, hitting those deadlines so that payroll comes out perfectly at you know on Fridays. It's it's got to be difficult. Let's talk about credentialing. Same kind of thing applies. A credentialer, people have different ways that they handle it, but let's pretend that you're a, a company that has a credential handling. An individual. Well, how many individuals can that one person handle? I mean, sure, there may be somebody who's starting on Monday, someone starting a week from Monday. They've got their things that are going. They're they're checking all that stuff, but it becomes another economics of scale that they can only handle so much. So the next thing you know, you've got departments being broken up where you've got a credentialer who's got two or three people underneath them. They're doing all the busy work and getting all the background and putting it together, and that credentialer is is validating and making sure that everything is perfect before they send it off or they're uploading it into the vendor to say, my candidate is cleared, let's get some first day instructions so they can hit the road and be there with bells on and know where, where to report to and what time and the whole nine yards. All of those things are difficult. Also throw in now in the recruiting aspect, the bigger the company, the more jobs they have, the more challenging a recruiter's job is. They've got, do I narrow it down? Do I? What do I present to this candidate? And that's why you'll see these recruiters sometimes from a big company kind of almost feeling like they're less caring. I know you have seen that way because they don't necessarily have the time to go into as much detail as a smaller agency could do or a medium-sized company can. So they have their challenges, that's for sure. It just is a little bit more of a difficult process. It takes more to run these. I guess I didn't realize that this episode is becoming a defense of monolithic agencies more so than it is why they're bad. And, and maybe that's good because I think I've spent a lot of time beating them up on their margin. Not so much their margin. I've, I've spent a lot of time saying that there are ways where you can make better money right now than with one of these big companies. And I felt like we were one of dozens and dozens of agencies that you could do better with. And I'm saying right now, like I said earlier, that may not necessarily be the case because you may be out of work, you know, trying to get a job with, with one of a medium-sized company when you can go with one of these guys and get it big. So this is kind of turning into be timely-wise a little bit more of a pro-monolithic agency, I guess, uh, podcast than I, than I thought it would have been. 
But 90% of the time, 95% of the time, we are not in this situation. So I, I go back to it. So, um, you know, there we go. So it takes more. Um, I think that they have, um, well, I know that when the market's thin, they've got a better advantage. Again, I'm just going to kind of sum it up this way. When they are fulfilling or shipping out less of their jobs to other companies, that means their recruiters have a little bit of pressure taken off them and saying that it's ours. Whether you fill it or Sally's filling it or John's filling it, somebody within the confines of this company, whether they're here in our main office or working remotely, we're going to fill this position. So we 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 can kind of back off a little bit and not feel like it's got to go. Now, they all have their hospitals that some of them are good and some of them aren't as good about the pressure they're going to put on them to fulfill these things. I mean, Remember, these guys want to fill it. If they've got a hospital, let's just say, in you know, the Bay Area of California who is not getting enough profiles and submissions for a job they desperately need, they're going to start getting on that, that big monolith company. And that's when you know, the, the, one of the VPs will walk out and say, hey, we got to you know, focus our attention here and here and here. He has never been in that kind of a bullpen, but that happens all the time where they're kind of saying, this is what we want to focus and work on. You just, I would tell you guys this at the end of this episode. I wouldn't fault any agency for any way that, they are, that their margins are being set. Other things you can. But when it comes to what an agency is paying you, it's just like anything else. You can choose to buy that product or go through that company, or you can choose not to. And there's compelling reasons sometimes for one or the other. It doesn't mean you're dumb if you go to work for a company that has a big margin and has a lower pay rate. There may be a compelling reason why you are. It's not for one of your other fellow travelers to judge. I just believe that as we move into 20, you know, the end of 2023, start going into 2024, certainly 2025, I predicted a long time ago, I said, what, three years? I said, five years? I can't remember what I said. Five years by 2028, I said, maybe it was 20, I think it was 2028. Did I give myself three years or five years? In the future, not too far off, I still believe that more and more companies are going to be going recruiterless. I just don't, it just doesn't make sense not to. The communication needs to be faster and... <laughs> I know my phone's back there. Phones are faster and things will communicate better as we fine-tune that process, and, and we are for sure. Here's what I want to say to sum this up. I guess monolith companies are, <clears throat> well, hey, they're here to stay. There are times like right now that I think you are seeing that, thank goodness they are. Because, you know, if, if there weren't these big companies, I, I, guess, I don't know, maybe it'd be difficult. Maybe you'd have better options. But they're, they, they are what they are. It's just like vendors. They are part of the system. And some of them are their own vendors. Being a monolith company makes sense. I, I will tell you this. I want to throw a couple things out there. I will tell you that they're going to do their best to fulfill their things on their own. They want a corner of the market. They would love to get rid of these other, you know, 485, whatever it is, of us agencies and just deal with each other. They would love that. They know that they can't. So I'm sure there's times where they definitely appreciate us. But when it comes to times like right now, they're squeezing. I will tell you, one of the companies um, has been very aggressive with our travelers saying, hey, would you like to work with us now? And they've never applied to that company. So I will warn you guys about that. I think that's kind of sleazy. I think it's kind of, uh, there's a lot of adjectives I can use. My, a couple of my travelers even came out and told me, hey, I got contacted and I've never sent in paperwork saying, I know your assignment ended or whatever. You know, we've got all this, this, and this. And then she said, actually, actually looked at the rates and they were terrible. And she looked at some reviews and said they were they're, they're bad. But their rates were really, really low. And it's hard for her coming from next-gen med staff to a rate that was that low. And, and a lot of it's not necessarily the agency's fault. The times were better than they are right now. So it really looked bad. But I said, well, here's what we'd be paying that same job. She's like, wow. So they are doing their best right now to keep us out. And this particular recruiter from this monolith agency had no problem telling my traveler that we are, you know, we would love to, to steal you from them. And uh, much to her credit, she wants to stick with us. But there's a point where she may not be able to. She may have to jump on board with something because she does not want to work. But she's talented. And there's options for her. It really depends upon where she's she's limited to. But if you're limited, and you, like I say, it's it's a good thing to do right now. But be aware of that. I don't like that practice. And I would say boo-hoo and, and uh, bad on them. If you have an, a monolith company that you've never applied to and you're working with an agency through them and your contract ends and they're starting to call you, I think that's really bad business. It tells you what we all know and that is that they steal you guys. They try to. Once, once we hand you over to you and you're working through them, they're going to have all your information. And you guys always wonder, how is that I'm getting called from these big companies? I never once applied to them because they're, they're doing that bad practice. And I think it is bad, but there's not much we can do about it um, except for know that if we're doing a good job and whatever company you guys are working for, if they're paying you well, then they're going to win every time. We're going to win every time. That's all I keep, you know, I, I go to sleep saying, I want my travelers to do what's best for them. 
I know that down the road, if I have a position and I'm even working through a monolith company, I will be able to pay them more directly than they can. And I, I trust that you, that travelers will remain smart and be selfish, deservedly so, that they're going to take the assignment that pays the most. That's what I'll tell you guys still. To wrap this up, I still think you're crazy not to take the highest paying contract that makes sense to you. Once you find a contract, if you find it with multiple agencies, if you find it with multiple agencies, I think you'd be crazy not to take it with the highest paying one out there. Um, unless they're brand spanking new, have no experience or who knows what, uh, but be careful. But there are times when a monolith company serves a great purpose. And I believe we have just seen or are seeing currently a time frame right now like no other. The uniqueness of that is that this is the time of the monolith companies. This this spring and this summer has been unique where they are controlling what little positions are out there and they're setting the rates and, and they're fulfilling, I guess, to the level they want to. I'm sure they could do more. But we see weeks like we have and this whole summer has been up and down and up and down. But when there are hospitals that are coming through that we haven't had the privilege of being able to recruit for for a while and all of a sudden they're there, it tells me that that means that that hospital is saying, hey, we need someone to hear and, and you're, we're not getting it from you guys. And that's probably a good sign for the whole, whole overall industry. Rates seem to be still very, very solid. I think, of course, they're not going to be pandemic, but they're solid. They're good rates. This is a better industry than it was five years ago as far as the amount of pay it's there. But it's not because agencies are dividing their slice of pie up smaller. It's because the bill rates are higher. If you can take a higher bill rate carved up with an agency that slices that better, you're in good shape. And I think you guys are still going to be in good shape. Ride this out. I've heard another year. I just don't think so. Um, I'll make some predictions. I don't know if I'll do them on this one, but here it is August. I guess I can. I think we're going to have more seasonality than we've seen in the last few years. I think that, so I, I believe that's going to play into travelers' hands well. Um, the depth of which I don't know, but I think that you guys will see much more opportunity here when the fall comes, depending upon how I've heard it's going to be a mild winter. If it is, that's going to hurt a little bit. But if it's a mild, if it's a you know normal type winter and things get cold up north, I think it's going to help the industry out a lot. I think there's going to be some fulfillment that needs to be made. I think the rates will stay high. And I think your favorite agency will start to get positions that you may not be seeing through them right now, which, again, choose the one that makes the most sense to you. And there you go. So tell all your friends, if you know someone's thinking about being a traveler, to subscribe to this channel or subscribe to this podcast. I think, I don't have my notes in front of me, that the next couple of things we're going to be recording are these newbie boot camps, part one, two, and three. And they're pretty heady. But I also think for you guys that are veteran travelers, it's almost like a fast course in some of the stuff we've done in the first 105 episodes. I think there's going to be some things in there that you will also go, oh, I never thought of that. Just kind of talking about the process of becoming a traveler all the way through, getting your first assignment and how to prepare for your last assignment. We broke it up into three episodes. Pretty informative, pretty in-depth, but I think it'll be good. So tell everybody to subscribe if they're looking, if they want kind of a crash course in in travel healthcare from an agency standpoint. We think this will be good. I think it'll be one of those episodes that will those three episodes that will last uh, uh, quite a while and stand the test of time and that stuff. So apologize for the, the break. We'll see if we can do better. May not be able to. I'm not going to make any promises on that. <laughs> not, not this year, that's for sure. But guys, as always, I appreciate you. We'll catch you next time on Travel Evolved. <laughs>